You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. You play to win. That, that, that's why you play the game. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Well, happy Thursday, Friday, for those of you that are fortunate enough to have off on Friday. And I, Let's try that again. Excuse me, let me translate that. That was uh, Danish. What I said to my Dane friends who listen religiously to the show is that I want to get out in front of this. I mentioned there was a chance that I would make up Monday to you by doing a show on Saturday. Here's the situation, and it's it's not exactly what most people probably wanted to hear. We are taking a little mini vacation going to Grandma's house. We're leaving Friday, which means I can do a show Friday, but... I'm not doing the laptop thing. So maybe if I can figure out a way to record the show with at least a little bit of quality on my phone, executive producer, maybe, uh, you know, if you got some ideas, then I'll give it a shot. But I'm officially not planning to do a show Saturday or Sunday. Um, I also took off m- Monday. I'll... I'll eh. I'm I'm just I'm just letting you know. I'm going to try really hard to at least do a cell phone show Monday. But I'm I'm just letting you know it might not be a thing. Also, new laptop is on the list. It's just, you know, I got to wait until the regular season cuz that's when the podcast is actually bringing in enough that I can actually buy some nice equipment for myself. Right now it's kind of well, I just got May's ad revenue, and I made enough to... I'm going to take my daughter to get some decorations for the basement. Maybe, like, a picture and some lights. Just just saying. It's not quite laptop territory. But new laptop is on the list. But anyways, on today's episode of the Packernet Podcast, did a little homework yesterday, because some of my favorite episodes or, or little projects that I do just kind of come up out of nowhere. And again, it's one of those things that I've kind of been dancing around, and it, it's like, all right, we, we got to get to the bottom of this, because especially since I keep claiming things, and I've been, I've been kind of on both sides of the issue, right? On, on one hand, I've made the comment several times, there's something strange about the fact that we're complaining about Aaron Rodgers' accuracy, however, he doesn't have an accuracy problem with Devontae Adams. I've talked several times about how if you just look up, look at angles, right? If if uh, if MVS takes a slightly sharper angle, angle than Aaron Rodgers is anticipating, the ball is going to sail too far. That's on MVS, but we're going to blame Aaron Rodgers because we don't know the difference. Now, I also mentioned, um, I think it was Bukowski, but I don't remember. Somebody had done a series of articles looking at it and, and coming to the conclusion that that wasn't necessarily the case. Now, I don't know how much insight he has into, you know, where the receiver's supposed to be at a given time, whatever. I'll leave that up to him to figure out you to determine whatever. I certainly am not going to pretend to know that stuff, but it is worth questioning. But then, on the other hand, I've been looking at it and saying, you know what, enough with the excuses, though. Because a lot of a lot of teams have, you know, maybe one good receiver and not so much after that, and they make it work. But, um... The very simple question was posed by Mr. JJ, and I'm probably butchering it, but I don't want to look it up. I want to just get to work here. Something to the effect of, oh, now i got to look. No, I'm not going to. I'm just going to make something up and pretend it's what he said. The, the crux of it is, how is this also a situation with other quarterbacks? Oh, and I'm going to punch myself right in the throat. All the homework. <laughs> I sent an email to myself, and I didn't include the Excel file. I just, it's just a, it's just an email that's blank. Great job, genius. That's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll still do it. I'm just going to have to do some of the math right here, which is going to take more time, but whatever. But, but it is interesting, and there is some nuance. And I might have to sick my research team on this a bit, because, you know, that's the thing. But... 
given that there's maybe a little bit of new, for, for example, some things that I noticed. The answer to the question, by the way, is yes. There is, seems to be a strong correlation. Eh, there, there's definitely a correlation between how bad a receiver is and how often a quarterback misses throws to them. And I'm not talking about drops. I'm subtracting drops from the equation. But And, and there's a lot kind of baked into this. But there's also, for example, average depth of target. The further down the field you are on average, MVS for example, the harder the throws tend to be. And so if you're generally targeted deeper down the field, MVS, than let's say a tight end or a running back like Jamal, who is, I think, Aaron Rodgers' best percentage, highest completion percentage, is to Jamal Williams. But average depth of target, um, rookies or first-year wide receivers, and I think that might be it. But there, there, there could be some other things. And the, the only reason I even bother to bring those up is because I'm noticing a correlation, but sometimes there's a blip. And those blips tend to occur with, um, for example, Tyreek Hill. I don't know what his average depth of target is, but I'm very surprised to see how often Pat Mahomes misses Tyreek Hill. Because obviously Tyreek Hill is an incredible football player. Pat Mahomes misses him a lot. The other really interesting thing is there isn't nearly as strong of a correlation until you get below a 60 PFF grade, which is to say below average. In other words, there might be a drop-off from guys that are in the 80s, to guys that are in the 70s and 60s. Maybe. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes it's just completely flat. However, when you drop down the depth chart and find that guy, and sometimes you don't have to drop. Sometimes it's a guy's number two. But when you find that guy that's at like a 52 PFF grade, the percentage of time the quarterback just does not seem to get the ball there. And, it, and, and here's the other thing. I don't have a real good stat on this, and I'm going to keep looking a little bit. I don't have a real good stat on errant throws, especially errant throws to particular wide receivers. So what I did is I just simply took targets to the wide receiver minus receptions minus drops. So these are throws to a receiver that were not caught and were not dropped. Now, there are still some things that are mixed in that. There are pass deflections. However, I'm still going to include that because if if the pass was deflected, it wasn't really a great ball, probably. Right, Because if the defender can get his hand on it, I mean, granted, maybe it's a 50-50 and you're trusting your receiver and he just doesn't come down with it. I don't know. In that case, I'm kind of trusting PFF to call it a drop, I guess. I don't know. There's going to be a little bit there. There's going to be a little bit I can't account for unless I can find an actual stat that I don't even know exists. Maybe I'll try to look over at SIS. I'm not sure. But for our purposes now, there's, there's a good enough number to work with understanding that there's a little bit of play and there's also some on the other side the question of average depth of target things of that nature that that could affect this but that was sort of the question so i want to go through a little bit of that again i'm gonna to have to do it live because i'm a dummy but i have a, a good enough recollection of uh of what the results were and who had what it's also very interesting in terms of, of really judging a quarterback you kind of learn a lot or at least start to to get some theories for example Pat Mahomes was shockingly bad to everybody except his extremely elite tight end, who, first of all, is probably not super deep down the field. I'll have to confirm that. And Well, no, I'm not going to right now. Again, th- there'll be a part two of this. Everybody else on his team, many of which have very good PFF grades, in other words, are generally very good wide receivers or receivers of, of some caliber, running backs, tight ends. His... Um, Bad throw percentage, which is essentially a a metric that I just made up, which is targets minus... So you you can do this yourself if you want to poke around. It's targets minus receptions minus drops, and then you get a value, and then you just divide it by targets. How many of the times when you threw to this person was it not caught and not dropped? That's all that is. I think everybody over... And it's hard to get a baseline, but but basically if you're at 30-ish percent or higher, that's pretty bad. That's when it starts to get kind of questionable. And for Pat Mahomes, everybody not named Travis Kelsey was over 30. And I shouldn't say everybody. Of the guys that he threw to a lot that were good football players, they were all around 30% or higher. On the flip side, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but it's, it is interesting. Again, you kind of learn and start to see or, or be able to develop some theories because there's things that should happen. There's things that you expect, and then what is the result compared to expectations is kind of how you start to develop theories. Because... The way that we can look at it from here is you kind of say, okay, I'm expecting you to throw at least 
around this much. It should be caught this often with this caliber of wide receiver. Was it? Yes. Okay. This guy's really bad. I'm expecting this to be closer to about 40% or, or, or so of your passes getting completed. However, you're, you're still at about 22%. And it doesn't really matter the caliber of wide receiver. You seem to be getting pretty good. Pa- so then I'm starting to wonder, this is a pretty good quarterback. And the only guy that I found, and I really only looked at good quarterbacks. I didn't really look at the bad ones because I wanted to compare. You know, because we're tr- the, the question really is about Aaron Rodgers. So I'm looking at high caliber quarterbacks, or at least people who are presumed to be high caliber quarterbacks. And the only guy I saw where it didn't seem to matter how good the wide receiver was, he was just on point, you know, 20-ish to 25% right in that range, maybe a little lower, even with wide receivers that are just kind of putrid, was Mr. Deshaun Watson, which, strangely enough, might prove their head coach, who everybody's been making fun of, right. Not, not, I mean, listen, it, it was a bad trade either way in terms of value, but if anybody out there, just based on this one metric, is going to be able to work with, you know, three decent wide receivers as opposed to one really good one and some blech. I shouldn't say that. Fuller isn't blech. Fuller's become a pretty good wide receiver, but whatever. It might be Deshaun Watson. Again, it's, it's just fun to get these new metrics because then you can start to develop new theories and ideas and see things from different... I, I don't know. I think it's fun. But that's what we're going to look at, even though we're half done now because I can't shut my mouth and just get to the break. I get excited about stuff, man. I like talking about stuff. I'm, 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 I'm happy this is a thing. And for the second time, I've created my own metric, and it is one of my favorite metrics. I got to tweak it a little bit, but I'm excited about it. Pressure percentage is the other one, although it, it technically kind of exists. Nobody really puts it out there, including PFF. That's why I have to do the math every time. And I do think it is an awesome metric. And it's mine. I own it. I win. Burn. I'm going to start my own website with my own stats, and it's going to be awesome because they're going to be good stats cool stats that you've never seen and then it's going to get real popular and it's going to start making money and then pff's just going to start adding it to their website and then then it's going to go away but it's going to be great you ever been tired hyper before just wondering i don't know i I just wondering if it's a thing i don't know i might have invented that too i'm not sure but anyways that is what's on the agenda um considering i went through a ton already we might touch on a few other things also because I'm doing everything completely backwards. We're going to do some news and notes on the other side of the break. I should have started with that. But, uh, you know, my show, my rules. But anyways, as always, if you'd like to support the show, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. It would be very greatly appreciated. You can join for as little as a dollar a month. I currently don't have anything special going on for Patreon. I used to. I'm sorry. I'll think about it. I will, I'll work on something. At this point, it's just a matter of supporting the show for the sake of supporting the show. Otherwise, a five-star iTunes review or Stitcher review be greatly appreciated. Stitcher is completely free. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to be a special user because it's not Apple. You can just go there, five stars, write a review, boom, done. Otherwise, word of mouth is fantastic. Also, inviting people to the Facebook group, just a thought. Just throwing it out there. Just giving you ideas on how to... Just helping you to help me. But anyways, let's take that break and uh, we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, Do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up 
six different bowls, mix and stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. So why don't we go ahead and start with Aaron Rodgers just to get a feel for what exactly we're talking about. Because that, that was really the first question. Because it was always just assumed in my mind that he misses more with other guys than with, for example, Devontae. And I, I honestly was shocked to see how often he misses Devontae. If we do our little trick, um, Devontae Adams was targeted 146 times. He caught 100 of them. He had 9 drops. So 146 minus 100 minus 9. On average... Aaron Rodgers misses Devontae Adams 25% of the time. Which I guess if you think about it in terms of three out of four times he's throwing to Devontae, it's a good throw. It's on target. It sounds a little better that way. Um, if you look at Alan Lazard, Alan Lazard had a... First of all, Devontae was an 88 overall grade. Um, Alan Lazard, 69, so about, you know, 70-ish, which is good. He was also at 25%. If you look at Aaron Jones, another good receiver. Granted, again, closer to the line of scrimmage, but we got to put a little bit of a curve on it. Again, I'll, I'll look at average depth of target at another time. There'll be a part two. But still, um, Aaron Rodgers missed Aaron Jones about 19% of the time. So very rarely does he miss Aaron Jones. If you look at Jamal Williams, again, I said it was a ridiculously small number. 8.5% of the time he misses. Eight and a half. Call it nine. I don't care very rarely misses Jamal. Again, closer to the line of scrimmage, but still, there's no problem between Rodgers and Jamal. And if you think about it, here's the other thing. We know there's a pretty big problem with Danny Vitale. Danny Vitale's another back. So he's not deep down the field, and he missed Danny Vitale 33% of the time. That's kind of what I'm talking about. There are certain guys, it seemed like he just was missing all of the time. And it seems strange. Danny Vitale, by the way, his PFF grade, his re- his overall grade was a 49, so again, below 60. His receiving grade was a 53.7, below 60. Interesting. Again, when you get below 60, in other words, PFF looks at you and says, you're not that good. You're kind of bad. Suddenly, there seems to be a disconnect between quarterbacks and those players. If you look at Jimmy Graham, um, 27%, so not terrible. But again, you might have to adjust for average depth of target. I know Jimmy did get down the field a little bit, but there's definitely a little bit of a spike there. Now, the real um, kind of kick in the gut comes with MVS. That's the one everybody knows is a problem. MVS's PFF grade was a 56.5, his receiving grade. So it's below that 60 mark. Also, unlike Jimmy Graham, it's the exact opposite. His average depth of target is extremely far down the field. In fact, his yards per reception, which generally there's a correlation there, average depth of target is going to give you a better answer, but it's 17 yards per reception. It's ridiculously far down the field. I mean, Jay Kumaro was technically a little further, which is crazy. But you factor in not a great receiver and then the average depth of target, and you get a massive spike, and that's what you have with MVS. He was targeted 55 times. He caught 27 of them, only dropped the ball twice. So anybody out there, and I haven't heard it, but anybody out there with the theory of, well, MVS is dropping all the... Nope, two drops on 55 targets. Geronimo had five drops on 58. Aaron Jones had four drops. Devontae had nine drops. MVS had two. Lazard, who had the exact same amount of targets, had three drops. But the off-target percentage, the bad throw percentage, was 47%. It was basically 50-50 whether or not MVS was going to catch a ball going his way. 50-50 on whether or not that ball was going to end up on target. Again, there, there could be pass deflections and other stuff going on. But even, a, again, a pass deflection, it's, it's, you're not throwing the guy open. You're not throwing it to where the only, only the receiver can get it. If, and, and also, if, if you're trying to pull that card... You're, you're either in denial or you didn't actually watch the season. Because how many times have we seen that ball just drop in the dirt over and over and over and over again? And it's like, dude, Rogers, what are you doing? He's open. Now, 
the, there's still the question of why. It could be MVS's fault. It could still technically be Rogers' fault. There, 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 are, there are questions about that. For example, if it's a simple go route, there's no way that's MVS's fault unless he's speeding up and slowing down or whatever. I mentioned how there seems to be a, a problem. For example, one, one example of this was San Francisco with Emmanuel Sanders. There seemed to be a slight uptick in missed throws compared to other equally talented wide receivers. Emmanuel Sanders was brought in late and, you know, he's new. He's new to the squad, so there's not that familiarity. It could just be a simple matter of they're just not really on the same page. And it, it that doesn't just mean MVS not doing the right things. It could just mean Aaron Rodgers can't quite gauge the guy. MVS is very fast. You got to get into a rhythm. You got to kind of know where to put the ball for this guy, which kind of goes back to what a lot of people are saying in terms of it would be nice to at least hear the reports that Aaron Rodgers and his wide receivers are out practicing somewhere. I know that sounds nitpicky and whiny to a lot of fans, but look, how hard is that? You got all off season. What are you doing? And as much money as, as, as you've got, and I understand it's your time, you do whatever you want, you're on vacation, you're not at work, I get it, but for a guy that talks about how competitive he is and he always wants to win and all that stuff, would it be so terrible to just load up all these guys, go out somewhere really nice, I'm talking it's basically still a vacation except for maybe a couple hours during that vacation you guys go out and throw some footballs around, which is also called playing a game. Some people do that on vacation because it's fun. They get a football, go out to the beach and play around. You probably shouldn't go to the beach because that's not going to help you gauge speed. But, I, I, you know, and I, maybe they do and it just doesn't get reported. I don't know. I don't, I don't have an itinerary of everything Aaron Rodgers does. But it wouldn't be the worst thing, especially when there seems to be an issue with some of your receiver. And, and regardless of whose fault it is, this is a great opportunity. This is a great opportunity for you to correct him and be like, look, this is what I needed you to do on that play. And just run through it. I mean, you know where the problems lie. Call Jair up. Have him come out. Have Kevin come out. I'm guessing a lot of these guys wouldn't mind. I'm talking. I'm talking a week. Out, out of all this time off, I'm talking about a week in like sunny California. Just be like, look, I want you guys out here. And and as the quarterback, if you say I want you here, they're coming. I'm just saying because the fact of the matter is, other guys are doing it. And I'm not. I don't, I don't want to question Aaron Rodgers and his heart and his passion. But the fact is, you got young, hungry quarterbacks coming for you coming for Super Bowls coming for for to be the reigning champion to be the best quarterback to be this and that and the other thing Russell Wilson has has supplanted himself has planted himself whatever you want the word is as one of the best quarterbacks in football he used to be kind of you know below where Rodgers is he's still going strong he's I would say pretty clearly at this point better than Aaron Rodgers or at least has been for some time one of the things he's done is practiced during the off season. And I don't just mean kind of exercising and getting your body right and dieting and, you know, throwing a little bit of footballs around and, you know, at targets or whatever Aaron Rodgers does. I'm talking about he calls up his guys, they go out to a football field and they play football. They practice throwing and catching and, and calling plays and all that good stuff. When you're hungry and you want it, that's what you do. You do that little bit extra. That's how you take things from people. It's not all just raw talent. And the fact of the matter is, raw talent isn't on Aaron Rodgers' side anymore. His age is is putting him on the other side of things. So if it's just a matter of, you know, your body working in your favor, the, the 22, 23, 24, 25-year-old, they've already got you beat. And now if you add in they're hungrier, they're working harder, they're working longer, they're studying longer. I mean, this is a new offense. I, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, we can blame it on COVID if we want, but okay, wh- what were you doing in January? What were you doing in December? What were you doing in 2018, 17, 16, 15? I don't know. I'm, 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 just, I'm just saying. It's fine to just sit back and say, well, it's MVS's fault pretty clearly. And, and again, there's some evidence of that because I'm going to look at some other quarterbacks. But let's fix it. If it's a little bit you and a little bit him, either way gets fixed when you make him better. Well, if he would have cut a little sharper. Great. Tell him that. Have him practice that. Run it again. Sharper. A big part of the reason this question even came up is is Devontae had his film breakdown 
And he talked about, I need to be in the right spot at the right time. I mean, the, the, the choreography in football is ridiculous. The exact precision is ridiculous. Fine. That's why, that, that explains it. Devontae gets it, Marquez doesn't. Sounds like Marquez needs practice. But he doesn't just need practice by himself out in South Florida or wherever his home base is, just getting, getting you know, balls thrown to him by his old college quarterback buddy. That doesn't help him get on the same page as Aaron Rodgers because the guy throwing to him isn't named Aaron Rodgers. The guy throwing to him doesn't know the playbook, doesn't know the expectations of Matt LaFleur on this play, doesn't know the expectations of Aaron Rodgers on a given play. I mean, it's just, and it, it just doesn't sound that hard to me. It sounds like a fun little trip. Hey, planning a day. All the guys are getting together. I expect you to be there. Me, all the wide receivers, and it doesn't even have to be Jair. If you don't want to worry about the fine, you can get anybody that you want to come out and play corner. I just need a body to get in his way so we can kind of work through the, the this, the that, the other things. That's all I need. And again, maybe they're doing it and it's just not getting re- reported. Remember I said this sentence because when the news article comes out that they did, I don't want you throwing this around at me. I'm saying as of right now, I haven't heard anything. I've heard reports of other quarterbacks doing it. I've never heard of a report of Aaron Rodgers doing it. It's one thing to say you're hungry. And to say you're competitive. But when you look at just a a very low-hanging fruit, not very difficult thing to do, that everyone's just like, nah, it's my time off. Okay, well, then you can say it and other people can actually do it. We'll let Pat Mahomes be about it while you talk about it. And we'll just hope that this scheme makes it a little easier for you and your wide receivers who are not on the same page. Sounds like a plan. Who knows, maybe A.J. Dillon will just run it 30 times a game and we don't have to worry about it anymore. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being mean and facetious, but I mean, come on now. Especially now that we, we didn't go out and get somebody. We don't have some top-tier wide receiver. And by the way, even if we did, you still have to get on the same page with him, which is going to take time. And maybe that'll be a boon for Funches, right? He's a veteran. If all it comes down to is I need you to understand how to be a wide receiver. If that's really all Aaron Rodgers needs, and really that, that might just be what Alan Lazard has. Maybe that's kind of what Kumaro has and, and why Rodgers likes Kumaro and all that stuff. He's not a very good wide receiver. He doesn't get open enough, which is why we, he disappears for long periods of time. By the way, so does Alan Lazard. Maybe that's why certain guys really pop up and shine and other times disappear. Because they're not good enough wide receivers to actually dominate anybody, but they know what they're doing. And so they're in sync. So maybe maybe just that alone... Again, I don't, I don't really know. Maybe there, there isn't going to be a good relationship between him and Funches. But if it's just a matter of, I need a competent wide receiver that can put himself in the right place at the right time, maybe Funches is going to be a great wide receiver for the Packers. Maybe that's, maybe that's what we've been looking for in this whole line about how everybody gets better with Aaron Rodgers. Right? Well, you got to add a little multiplier because now they've got Aaron Rodgers. He's never had a quarterback quite this good before. Maybe that's where that comes in. You know, Jimmy Graham was obviously in a steep decline. So, fine, we'll give him a pass there. Although, there's a long line of tight ends that have come in and just been their worst ever. Martellus. Martellus was a great tight end. Everywhere he went, he comes here, suddenly falls off. I don't know. I'm just saying. Trying to come down on the positive side of this now. If all Aaron Rodgers needs, along with all this scheme needs, is a competent wide receiver that knows how to put his body in the right place at the right time, a veteran like Funches might make a lot of sense. He might just be a slightly upgraded Alan Lazard. Anyways, let's let's back up this point now that I've completely derailed this train and uh, look at a couple others. Um, if we head over to the New England Patriots, pretty stark contrast. The one guy that um, could be seen as a good wide receiver for the Patriots is Julian Edelman. Gets a billion targets. He's the, the main guy over there. He also has a billion drops. He had 11 drops, which is kind of a lot. What you see is... 25%. It was actually exactly 25%. So, same with Aaron Rodgers and Devontae, and Aaron Rodgers and Alan Lazard, 25%. Seems to be kind of the going rate for just a normal quarterback-to-wide receiver relationship. Some do much better than that, but that's it seems like it's a decent enough number. Now, if we scroll down a bit, the um, and I'm just going based on targets. Who gets thrown the ball the most? After that is James White. He's graded relatively highly. After that is Philip Dorsett. He's got a 64 overall grade, so I'm going to skip over that. The next guy is Mohamed Sanu. Mohamed Sanu was targeted 48 times, so right around the Alan Lazard range. But his grade was a 56.9, so he's below that 60 mark. The missed target percentage was 35%. I mentioned Houston is a, a little bit of an outlier here because I, I don't think I can get anyone at 30%. But if you look at, for example, DeAndre Hopkins, 168 targets, 
119 receptions, only 6 drops, 25.6%. What do you know? If you look at Will Fuller, another highly graded wide receiver, not obviously DeAndre Hopkins, but a good wide receiver, he was at 22%. The first wide receiver you come to, and it's a pretty small sample size, whatever, but it's that is a below average grade, is Kiki Kuti. I think he was a rookie. Kiki was at 29%. So it's, it's not a massive number. It's not up in the 40s or high 30, but it's still a slight uptick. Again, very impressed with this quarterback who's able to get the ball pretty accurately to just about everybody. This is uh, sort of the outlier here. If you look at Pat Mahomes, I mentioned how um, Travis Kelsey's really the only guy. This is sort of an outlier as well to where even really good wide receivers are pretty bad as far as the numbers. Travis Kelsey, 19%. Tyreek Hill, 29%. So, I mean, it, it's still not quite 30, but it's it's not a super great number. But but again, if you add in average depth of target, if we assume he's usually a more of a deep threat, although he might not be, because I know he gets a lot of like wide receiver screens and stuff, and he just takes it to the house. But if we give him that leeway, then we could say, okay, maybe that accounts for that extra 4-ish percent from, you know, 25, which is kind of the, the going rate, I guess. But then you look at Sammy Watkins, who Although not elite, he's still at a 70 overall receiving grade, which is pretty solid. 33%. That's not good. So this is kind of the outlier to the other, the other direction. Pat Mahomes seems to be missing a good amount to just about everybody but Travis Kelsey. Dallas is tough because Dallas actually, it's so crazy that they were so bad. Dallas doesn't really have anyone below average. I mean, Jason Witten technically was, but I mean... His average depth of the target is like two yards. The guy can't even run beyond two yards. His yards per reception was 8.4 compared to Michael Gallup at 16.8 and Amari at 15. So, I mean, as you scroll down, Randall Cobb was a 70. Um, you really have to go all the way down to Cedric Wilson, who got eight targets. So it's not really worth even looking at that. However, his numbers were pretty solid with Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, Jason Witten, Randall Cobb, Ezekiel Elliott, obviously. Um... But then as you work your way down the list and you get to Tavon Austin, who is the lowest graded of the wide receivers that, you know, got somewhat decent targets. And also he's got very few targets probably for a reason. But his receiving grade was a 63.9, so he's just above that that metric. But there's a massive jump. All of these guys, 20, I mean, 18, 19, 20, 24, 25%. I think Amari was, was around 25%. Tavon Austin, all of a sudden there's a jump up to 43%. Again, I, I don't have anyone that falls below that 50 that I can look at. Tavon Austin is the closest thing, and there's a massive jump. Randall Cobb, really low. Everybody was really low. But there was, there was just, it was just off between Tavon and Dak. It just wasn't working. Again, these are like MVS numbers. Um, if we look at Carson Wentz and the Eagles, Zach Ertz, number one most targeted guy. He is a tight end, but I think he still is relatively deep. I mean, it's kind of funny that the two most targeted guys are Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard. They use tight ends like crazy. But Zach Ertz is at 28%. A little bit high, but whatever. If you look at Dallas Goddard, the other tight end, 19.7, but we'll call it 20%. Both graded very highly. If you look at Alshon, it's 30%. Not very good. This is kind of kind of similar to Pat Mahomes, where it's almost as if 30% is more the baseline for him. Right? Zach Ertz, 29%. Alshon, 30%. Still, if we look at Nelson Aguilar, it jumps up to 35%. Nelson Aguilar is below that 60 mark. So again, there, there's just, it, it's not perfect. And there's differences depending on the quarterback. There's differences depending on, you know, the, the depth of target, the team, the scheme, the uh, familiarity. But what you're not seeing is consistency from bad receivers and good receivers. Even if, you know, Carson Wentz is not not doing a very good job with his accuracy and is kind of floating around 30% as opposed to a lot of other quarterbacks at 25%. Still, you get to Nelson Aguilar, who is the one really bad wide receiver among the guys that gets the ball a lot. I shouldn't say really bad. He's 54. He's below average. But still, he's below that 60. What happens? There's a spike. There's a spike in the number of times the quarterback misses the guy. That's all we're looking for. And I came into this blind. I thought, yeah, that's a good question. Let's look at it. And sure enough, with with a fair amount of consistency when you find that guy when you go down the list 
whatever the baseline is, as you go down the list, when you get to that guy, or, or at some point you get to that guy, whether it's the bad receiver or in the case of Dallas, you get down to Tavon, which is a guy that just doesn't get the ball very often and probably for a reason, there's this spike. The quarterback just seems to miss more often. I think sometimes we just look at it as when a quarterback misses, it's just because he misses. It's just because he did a bad job. There is sort of an element, though, of the receiver's responsibility for the quarterback throwing a bad pass, as strange as that sounds. But remember, this isn't... This isn't uh, This isn't the receiver goes and runs a route and then stands there and then the quarterback has to throw to a static target. A lot of these throws are anticipatory, meaning as you come out of your break, I'm throwing it. And so I have to be able to calculate in my mind as the quarterback, not only the speed at which you're running, but the angle at which you're running. And if you don't run at the right speed and angle that I'm anticipating, now again, that could be my fault as the quarterback for not understanding you, but there's also a good chance. And again, by looking at team after team after team, there seems to be a high correlation that it's the wide receiver who doesn't seem to know what he's doing. That that's going to account for a few more balls not quite getting to where it needs to get. You know, I mean, the Vikings. And the Vikings are kind of like Dallas. They don't really have bad receivers. But just compare Stephon Diggs, Adam Thielen, and Laquan Treadwell. And we know there's been an issue between Laquan and and uh, and this team. I mean, they let him go and brought him back. And, and he did grade out fairly well, but that was a really small sample size because they brought him back and he's always graded out pretty terribly. But just just the, the targets, just the quarterback's ability to get the ball to Laquan Treadwell. Stephon Diggs, 25%. Adam Thielen, 20%. Laquan Treadwell, 44%. He missed. If, it, if, if none of it comes down to the wide receiver, the quarterback's missed percentage should be relatively equal for every single wide receiver and then adjusted for basically just difficulty of the throw. So average depth of target would be a major factor. But you're not going to see a difference in 25%, 20%, and 44%. Some of this absolutely has to fall on the wide receivers. Final example, New Orleans Saints. New Orleans Saints uh, is one of the teams I point to in terms of why we don't have excuses. They have one good wide receiver and nothing. Drew Brees, who is probably the most accurate quarterback in all of football, hit Michael Thomas, missed Michael Thomas, I should say, 14 percent of the time ridiculously low on 188 targets 156 were caught six were dropped michael thomas had more receptions than most wide receivers had targets look at their number two wide receiver ted ginn again one of the most accurate quarterbacks in football the second most targeted wide receiver on the team with a 56.7 overall receiving grade the missed target percentage was 36 percent drew Brees missed him 36 percent of the time Again, we're not talking about drops. Drops are re- removed from the equation. 55 targets, 31 receptions, 4 drops. 55 minus 31 minus 4 divided by 55. The massive difference between Michael Thomas and Ted Ginn cannot simply be explained by, you know, slightly harder passes and, you know, better DBs on Ted Ginn, which obviously is not a thing. So, either way, it's it's an interesting thing to look at. Either way relationship uh, between quarterback and wide receiver and a wide receiver's ability and and that's kind of an interesting thing as well a a wide receiver's ability to do his job is partly down to his his talent but it's also very largely down to his ability to to just play correctly right so there's there's do the right thing regard even if there's nobody on the field Right? If, if we don't have any DBs, any safeties, linebackers, nobody's on the field. It's, it's a quarterback and a wide receiver. This would be Aaron Rodgers and MVS just out on the field, just playing, just throwing. Can we complete passes? Can you be where I put the ball? Then there's the secondary ability, which comes down to talent. Can you beat the guy across from you? That's Devontae coming off the line of scrimmage. That's, that's what we saw yesterday in that film breakdown, him beating guys at the line of scrimmage, his, his ability to manipulate guys and use his body. to That comes down to talent on the field. But then the other reason why he's such a good wide receiver is that he knows the timing, he knows the positioning, and Aaron Rodgers also knows Devontae. He knows his speed. He, he, it just all three of these factors come together. That's when you get good wide receivers. Again, Alan Lazard, I think, is number one. He knows how to put his body where it needs to be at the right time, and Aaron Rodgers knows how to get the ball to Alan Lazard. I think the reason he would disappear at times is because he's not overly talented. He's not an elite route runner. He doesn't have great speed. But just by having two of those three, you can see production like we saw. 
especially if you if you have a uh, head coach that's talented enough to know how to use players to manipulate scheme. It would be interesting to see um, how often Alan Lazard succeeded against man coverage compared to zone coverage. If it's man-to-man, I'm thinking it's going to be a little bit more difficult for guys who are less athletically gifted to win. And I don't just mean speed. I'm talking, you know, like Devontae and route running and all that stuff. If you don't have a lot of tools there, beating man is going to be much more difficult. However, if it's zone and you're schemed open, it really just, it's, it's no different than you and Rodgers playing without anybody out there. It's just about get to this spot on the field where there's no defenders at the right time, in the right spot, and I'll get the ball to you. And I think some guys do that well. I think Kumaro is a guy like that. I think Jimmy is probably a guy like that. I think Lazard is a guy like that. We know Devontae is a guy like that. I think EQ and MVS have to get there. And again, maybe part of it is Aaron Rodgers needs to get there as well. I don't know. But that's also why there's some some credibility to the idea that MVS could actually be a good wide receiver, but we don't know if he's going to get it. We don't know if it's going to click. I think a lot of really bad wide receivers in the NFL are guys that just can't quite get it. Ted Ginn's been in the league a long time. Apparently something hasn't clicked with him. And again, these, these numbers aren't perfect because we don't know how many of these numbers are actually errant passes. And I'm going to try to find that, find that metric if I can, um, just off, off target throws. And essentially, the, uh, PFF does, ha- I, I can find how many throws were not great by looking at adjusted completion percentage. You know, if we look at, um, you know, just take Drew Brees here. 37 attempts, 281 completions, 14 drops, 10 were throwaways, which is something else to take into account, although that wouldn't be considered a target for the wide receiver. Two batted passes, five spikes, five times he was hit as he threw. So the remaining um, throws that were not completed, you would assume are probably errant passes. But I can't break that down into each individual wide receiver. So, you know, but still, the, the, the fact that there is a correlation definitely points to the fact that lesser wide receivers are getting the ball thrown to them less accurately, which would be odd that a quarterback would be at fault for that. And it also changes the way we look at wide receivers. Um, you know, why is it, and this this is probably, this goes beyond wide receiver. This is every position. Why is it so many talented first-round guys don't pan out? Because athleticism only takes you so far. Jerry Judy, based on athleticism, is going to be awesome. What do we know about Jerry Judy in terms of his ability to put himself in the right place at the right time and build that chemistry with his new quarterback, who is not a very good quarterback, by the way? I don't know, but I think that's an important question to ask. And, and MVS is the perfect example of this. He's got all the athletic tools you could ever want in a wide receiver and more, but he doesn't have that extra ability. right? I mean, just, just something as simple as, as you're running a go route, you kind of slow down and then speed back up. It's over. It's as soon as you take your foot off the gas a little bit, ball's gone. You're not gonna get it. You know, if you look back at even if you watch that video, if you haven't yet, go check it out. Somebody posted it in the Facebook group, or you can find it anywhere. Uh, Devonte Adams sat down with Brian Baldinger, and he, he just kind of broke some stuff down. But one of the plays, and I, th- I thought it was weird, it was the one in which he beat Sherman in Seattle. When you watch it, it's strange because he beats him, and then he kind of like runs back to him. It's like, why are you doing that? Because what he said is he jumped too far inside. And Rodgers wants him a little bit further to the outside. So he actually runs back basically into Richard Sherman, which seems counterintuitive, and then cuts it up. Imagine if you're a guy, for example, like MVS, and you actually beat it. We won't say beat Richard Sherman because, you know, it's it's not really the important part of this. And I don't want people to get hung up on something that probably would never happen. But let's say he beats anybody. There, There could be a situation in which... He beat a guy, he's excited about it, and he wants to just simply run away for him, so he stays too far inside, and what we see is, and as an end result, Aaron Rodgers throws the ball too far to the sideline, misses MVS by just a little bit, and we look at it and go, Rodgers, what is your problem? Whereas Devontae, his body would have been closer to the, to the line of scrimmage and would have caught that pass. The reason is, the difference between the exact same plays between MVS and, and Devontae aside from one being caught and one being too far to the sideline, is the fact that Devontae just so happened to be closer to the sideline because he understands where he's supposed to be. And this is a hard thing to do because I'm, I'm making all these scenarios up. But again, the, the data seems to point toward lesser wide receivers not getting the ball as much, and this is a reason why. And when you listen to wide receivers explain their job, they make it very clear 
that it's not just beat the guy in front of you. And then it's the quarterback's job to just get the ball to you. No, 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 no. I got to beat this guy and then I got to go be on my mark. My spot on the field is right there. And also, you listen to him, for, for example, situationally, things change. Depending on where the defense is, depends where my body is. Depending on where the safety is, depends even after the snap, how sharp of an angle I take. And so this isn't even predetermined. That's the other thing. You got to just know this stuff really well because there's no predetermined. On this play, I want you to to run at this angle. No, on on this play, depending on the safety. If he jumps, I want you to go behind him or, or in this case, I want you to go in front of him or even when you come out of your break. All these things change. Aaron Rodgers knows the rules to that game. Devontae knows the rules to this game and Aaron Rodgers misses him only 25% of the time, meaning three out of four times, he's going to throw an accurate pass. It's about half the time to MVS. And, and again, I, I don't think that's a mistake. Some of it probably is Aaron Rodgers' fault. Again, we've seen pretty straightforward go routes where he's just running in a straight line. It's hard to put that on MVS. Even if he's not quite in the same spot, you see where he is, you see where he's running, try to get the ball there. But anyways, I, I thought that was a very interesting discovery I'm glad to get some numbers there. I want to try to make that a little bit more concrete, but it's a, it's a very good starting point um, and an answer to something that we've kind of just been assuming for kind of a while. But anyways, I got to get going. You folks have yourselves a fantastic Thursday. I will talk to you all tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.